If you find yourself outside in the break of a live poker tournament and you hear someone kicking a football against the wall, that'll be Timothy Adams. The Canadian has started 2019 like a house on fire, winning high stakes tournaments in the Bahamas, in Monte Carlo, and most recently his personal best score of 3.5 million at the Triton Poker main event in Jeju. In this episode of I Am High Stakes Poker, we learn a little bit about Adam's early childhood. We learn about how values and beliefs have shaped his life and turned him into one of the greatest poker players that the high stakes scene sees in action today. Timothy, how's it going? Uh, it's going well, yeah. Do you know what? It's always good interviewing someone who's on form. Because generally when someone's on form, they're, in a, they're more loose and they're in a better frame of mind. Mm-hmm. So um, hopefully we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that later on in the future. But I want to go uh, back to the beginning and learn a little bit about early Timothy Adams. Okay. Uh, what was the nickname that the kids gave you at school? <laughs> um, actually, I don't think I really had a nickname. I mean, growing up playing soccer, they would maybe call me, uh, I don't know, people would call you Timmy or... Timmer, or like there's a lot of these random nicknames, but I guess just Tim. When I played soccer, uh, they nicknamed me, it was at the time when Luis Figo was a really like prominent player in the world. He was mm-hmm. playing for Portugal and I had a, I have a little bit of Portuguese in me. So the kids on my team were calling me Figo. <laughs> we played like the same position. So that was like one of the nicknames. Yeah, because you are quite dark skinned and you, you know, you, it's like, you always look like you have like a permanent suntan. Yeah, was, yeah. That, was that a problem when you was growing up in school? Uh, it was interesting, actually. That, that's uh, something I didn't really, re- like, I grew up in a very white area. <laughs> and I didn't really realize I was, like, a mixed race kid until mm-hmm. I was, like, I don't even know. I was, like, 12 or 13. I just thought I was, like, a, a white kid. But I obviously have a tan. <laughs> and people would even ask me, like, oh, like, where have you been? Have you been out in the sun a lot? Or have you traveled somewhere? Because you have a really nice tan. And I was like, no, this is, this is the way I look. <laughs> yeah. Is that because you're, 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 one of your parents wasn't around when you were younger? Um, no, my, my dad is English and he's fully white, like doesn't look like my father, <laughs> like has blonde hair, blue eyes. Right. And my mom is darker. She has, she's a mix. Uh, she has Indian she has a bit of Portuguese, she has Irish and Scottish. So she's a complete like mutt, I guess is the phrase. <laughs> mutt. I guess I've, ne- I've never heard I've You've never, never heard mutt? Well I have heard mutt, but I've never heard anyone call their mother a mutt before. I, I think <laughs> I'm was... just I'm just copying what people have told me, I guess. But Mrs. Yeah. Adams, if you're watching this, uh, <laughs> mutt. It, mutt is being said in a very nice way. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a nice way uh, nice word. Um, well maybe you can think of a different one later. Yeah. So what did you want to be when you when you grew up then when you was a kid? Was it a soccer player? It was yeah. I mean, I either wanted to be a hockey player or a soccer player. Um, that was for sure. Like, I just played sports all the time. Um, was super competitive, and that's what I aspire to be. And even in today's standards, I, you know, I look up to the to the soccer players and the hockey players, and kind of still still wish <laughs> still wish I could be one. But yeah. How realistic was your dream of being a footballer when you were younger? What stage did you get to? Yeah, I basically came to a point where I, I had to choose a sport because I was playing uh, hockey in the winter and soccer in the summer. Um, I chose soccer to, to take it full on when I was, maybe I was like 14, and I got to a very high level. Um, I was playing uh, in the top league in my province. Um, yeah, we would compete in like big tournaments in the US. Uh, we'd play like very good teams. We'd have scouts at our games. But all those years ago, in Canada, um, there wasn't really anywhere to go. If you were really good, you'd have to go to Europe and try to get a trial. And guys I played against got trials at big clubs in Europe and stuff like that, and I didn't. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to be. Uh, I wanted to be a soccer player. Did you have anybody pushing you and helping you at that point? Or was I it- mean, my parents took me to all the games. I mean, my parents, they were super dedicated. And yeah, I was super lucky that I had that. Uh, I had that option um, because not everyone did. Um, Yeah, I mean, I pushed myself a lot. I was like addicted. (laughs) Like I would train every day by myself. I would go in our garage and just create scenarios over and over and over again. And yeah, I I had this thing where it's probably like obsessive compulsiveness. I I had to touch the ball every day some 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 way. I'd always have uh, one of these little miniature soccer balls in our house 
and it would drive my parents crazy. And I would kick it against the walls and try to nutmeg my mom in the kitchen and stuff and just stuff like that. Yeah, you just, still got that now because I, I actually saw you in Jeju just before you got sick and you was outside on your own kicking a ball against a wall. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I don't want to lose because uh, I find it like really therapeutic. Like you're, when you're playing a sport, any sport, I guess, um, you're really in the moment and you're not really thinking about anything else. And that's what I had with soccer. And growing up, that was what I did. I used to always go, like I said, I used to go play by myself and, or play with a friend. And yeah, I think it's, it's a form of therapy and it's something that I realized quite a while ago when I've gone through spurts without playing. And then when I do, I, you know, it's, it relieves stress. Mm. It, it, um, it's a way to express yourself. And yeah, I think I don't want to lose that, so. It's pretty cool that you wanted to be a professional footballer and you ended up in being a professional sportsman, gamer, <laughs> gambler, whatever you want to call it, but mm -hmm. it's just, it's, a, it's akin to playing a sport, isn't it? And I mean, it is interesting that happened. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities. And when people ask me about, uh, about poker players in general, I say a lot of them had similar paths. Either a lot of them were in, well, they were playing strategy games like chess, or backgammon, magic. And then there were a lot of other guys on the other side that played sports. And I'm on that side. On that mm. side. I didn't really play the strategy game. So... For me, it was still a surprise that I got into poker because I never really played card games. Um, but yeah, uh, it's weird. Sometimes I think I'm like, how? I'm still surprised that I play poker. It still feels weird to tell people like, yeah, I play poker because I don't know. I, it doesn't fit into the stereotype <laughs> that we're raised with, does it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, tons of similarities and that I think it's the 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 common denominator is the the competitiveness hmm. you're competitive you you want to compete you love that feeling of having to get ready for something perform and execute and then afterwards you reflect or whatever and then you're on to the next sports game or poker game or whatever yeah at some point the dream dies i guess uh, can you remember the point where you were like ah this football thing ain't gonna work out and then you had mm -hmm. to start thinking about what you was gonna be in as you were going from a teenager to being a man? Yeah, I think it was when I was heading to university, probably. I started to, I mean, it was probably the thought came earlier when I was maybe like 17. And when I was, uh, that I wasn't gonna be a professional soccer player and it wasn't, you know, I wasn't gonna take that next leap to go play in Europe or anything like that. Mm. Um, I just struggled with some stuff. Like I don't, I was technically very good, but I shied away from tackle sometimes i wasn't i didn't have that like you know uh some kids are that completely Roy Keen, that Roy Keen, right completely oh, yeah. fearless and i had a little bit of it but um yeah and also probably i was too much in my own head like looking back at it i mean i was a kid and mm. um but yeah i think it was when i went to university then i was focusing on other things that's when i got introduced to poker when i was 18 uh my first year of university um and i was more interested in social like socializing partying with friends and just living a university lifestyle so that's and like i said got introduced to poker so that's when i for sure turned that you know i wasn't going to be a pro athlete that was that was obvious are there are there people now in the highest stakes of the game that, that were there right at the beginning of the kernel of you becoming a poker player that are still here now yeah yeah <laughs> uh surprisingly a lot of them um it's funny because we're all around the same age. Uh, just thinking back when I was in university, it was um, we'd go to Turning Stone, New York, quite a bit to play poker. Mm -hmm. um, and there were faces like Bryn Kenny, Andrew Lichtenberger, jeez, uh, I'm pretty sure Dan Smith, even though he's a little younger, maybe he came a little, a little later on. Um, yeah, there were so many, so many guys that are that are still playing poker at a very high level. Um, yeah, it's crazy. What about your, what about your advisors back then? Who, who, were the, uh, who were the best coaches or the best mentors when it came to your game in the early days? Um, I mean, I was lucky. I had, in university, we, there was a group of us that played, um, maybe five or six of us that played fairly seriously. Like we were playing online. Uh, and at that time we were playing the, high, the higher stakes tournaments, like $200 tournaments, which were like, those were the high stakes tournaments. Yeah. And um, I had a good solid group of friends that were all like very 
they were actually like very close friends, and then they were also, you know, we also played poker together. Um, I had a couple guys who I thought were extremely talented. They, they were more talented than I was, and there's just so many variables of who carries on in, in this game, and there's, you know, there's luck, there's mental game, there's, there's a million different variables, and yeah. Um, I was lucky I had specifically two guys who really helped me like progress. It was, it was cool, like looking back on it. When, can you remember the moment when you decided that, hey, I'm kind of gonna make this like a really big major part of my life? Jeez, um, I don't even, like, there was so many. Like, you know, you win. I remember in my second year in university, I must have been 19, like, I'll never forget that, this one. I won a, or I came second in a $3 <laughs> rebuy for, and I had all my friends like behind me watching me and I came set, it, like the field was like thousands of players and min, like a mini stakes tournament, but I, I came second for like 4,000 or something. And I remember they all left my room and I just like laid on my bed and I was like, wow, like I have $4,000. Like I felt so like I made it or something that I, you know, I could play on my own. And uh, I mean, that's a very small moment, but it's something I really remember for some reason that I think it was like, it was like, wow, I have money to play with. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's like the, again, going back to stereotypes as young boys, I guess, we want to play games for a living. That's all we want to do. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden we make some money out of it. I mean, the, the head starts going, doesn't it? You know? Yeah. Um, especially when you're that young, you're just, uh, you know, I think I was still pretty responsible. I, I wasn't too reckless with my money. I had moments where I was. Um, but yeah, of course, like, starting to make your own money playing a card game and I loved the game and I was always so intrigued. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what hooked me. Um, and I don't even know if it was so much about the money. Like, of course, the money gave me freedom and made me feel, mm -hmm. you know, in university feeling not powerful, but being like able to be careless with money, like spend money on friends, buy whatever you want, stuff like that. Um, but I think it was mainly about like the competition competing, like wanting to win and stuff like that, and yeah. And um, on values a little bit, what, what are the sort of values that uh, you prescribe to and uh, you, you kind of like act as a cornerstone to your decisions in life? Mm. I mean, the main one is to just be honest. Uh, I've, you know, gone through my own journey of becoming, I guess, a man and learning that just being honest is the best way to be a person. Um, if you're honest, you don't have to really worry about anything. Um, yeah, just being honest, being good to the people around you, being good to random people. Um, yeah, that's, those are the two, the two main things, just being good and at the same time, if you have success, not to let it get completely to your head because it can also go very fast. and. Uh, yeah, just to remain down to earth and humble and remember your roots. And that's, I know that sounds a little, you know, like a blanket stereotypical answer, but I think there's truth to it, a lot of truth, yeah. I mean, I watch you around the poker room and, you know, the, the people are coming and giving you your drinks and giving you your, your, your meals and you're always really polite to them whenever I talk to you. You know, you're always very polite. You're here now, you know, you know giving me your precious time. Yeah, so I see how that works. I mean, what, what are the, some of the things that, that bug you when you look around the poker table <laughs> and you see people behaving? I mean, in the higher roller environments, guys are pretty good, I think, um, to staff, to, to just anyone in the poker environment. Um, what bugs me, I don't know, I just, people that are being mean or rude to other people um, for no particular reason. Also, if people feel like they have some sort of status and they feel like they can look down on other people, um, definitely rubs me <laughs> the wrong way a bit where I'm just, you know, people are people and uh, yeah. When you see that happening, are you, the, are you the type of guy to just mm, kind of bite your tongue and let it happen? Yeah, like, I'm a, I'm a little non-confrontational, so. Is that going back to these tackles again in football? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, no, for sure. If someone is being out of line, then I don't mind speaking up. Um, 
some people you can't fix <laughs> or cure. And yeah, that's, that's where I'll leave it at. And uh, on status a little bit, let's talk about that a little bit more if, that, if that's all right. Um, are, are, you ever, are you ever consciously aware and do you think about your status within poker and how that relates to your status being in life? I mean, do you give that much thought about status? I mean, I just think it's, um, I've always thought that it's a bit of a slippery slope or a dangerous path to go down if that's what you're trying to achieve is having a certain status. Um, cause ultimately you're just, w what I think it's connected with is feeding the, feeding the ego, making yourself, you know, feel good with external things. And yeah, I think I've, I've learned in the past that as long as you're okay internally and you feel good inside that all the noise and all the external factors, like it's not sustainable. Like, you know, like you, it's just. The way I look at it, it is, yeah, I mean, status is, you know, having people look up to you and stuff like it's, it's nice. Um, but I think you have to manage it right at the same time. Like, um, like the people that I personally respect the most are the people that have worked really hard and are really successful, but are still down to earth. Um, yeah, I always have admired people like that where they're approachable and they're not thinking they're just better than you because they drive a nicer car and have a nicer house. Uh, and I've, yeah, I've had moments in my life where I made those realizations. Seems like grassroots um, and being down to earth is really a, a core value as well for you. Where, where does that come from? Um, I suppose my, my parents, for sure. They've, they're just hard workers and, um, my dad has done well in his professional career, but he's not a flashy guy. He's pretty frugal. Um, and yeah, also, you know, keeps things to himself. Doesn't, uh, doesn't make a scene of how successful he's been or how well he's done. And I guess, yeah, I've got it from my dad. I often joke, joke around with my boy now because he's 18 and I, and I say, oh, hurry up and be rich so you can, you can sort me out so I don't have to yeah. uh, be a Montenegro interviewing people. <laughs> he uh, makes comments like, my dad makes comments yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've, you've done it. Um, how does that dynamic work when you become very, very successful financially mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got family and friends around you? I mean, does, yeah. does anything change? Does it get a bit awkward? I mean, nowadays, no. I mean, I think when I was younger, maybe you could feel a little bit where it's a new thing to your friends and not all friends. I'm saying some yeah. people would, you'd feel it a little bit like, why is this guy doing so well? Like, what has he done? Um, that's so special. Um, but I think at the same time now it's been so long that, I mean, and I don't think uh, at the same time, I have probably shown friends and family that I'm, that I'm still the same guy. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm still close with all my childhood friends and my friends from university and, the topic of money and these kind of things, they aren't even discussed. So, um, yeah, I'm really lucky. I have, I have a really solid group of friends and solid family and there's, there's none of this um, envy or jealousy or anything associated with my poker. Hmm. There's money and then there's money. And I know very few high stakes poker players or any poker players have like 100% of their action. Mm -hmm. But when you win multi-millions, like mm -hmm. you did in Jeju, what's it like when you just, all the noise is dissipated, there's no one around, you're just lying on your bed. Mm -hmm. what, what's the kind of things that are going through your head? To be honest, like I, it didn't really set in until, it was super weird. I had this really weird moment <laughs> um, about two and a half weeks later where I was just sitting there and I was in like a group setting. I was at a, my girlfriend's sister's graduation party <laughs> and I was just sitting there and I just had this moment where I was just like, oh, holy crap. Like I won that poker tournament for a lot of money. And I was like, yeah, that's really cool. I, 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 for a moment I was like, I didn't really believe it for a second. And I think that's when it finally sunk in and I was like, oh, this is, <laughs> This is something very good and I'm very happy and of course it's something I wanted to accomplish was to win a, you know, win a high stakes tournament and yeah, win money for myself and of course win money for an 
investors and mm -hmm. yeah when you when you think about that kind of like pinnacle moment in your career and let's hope there's going to be even more uh, beyond that who are the inspirations that you've looked up to in your life you said about Luis Figo earlier on so we can talk about outside of poker as well mm -hmm. who are those inspirations that you can look at and think yeah like they they actually played a part in me winning that tournament in Jeju somewhere along the way it sounds kind of silly but a lot of my peers in poker like my closest poker friends they inspire me because they just work their ass off and it forces me to work my ass off as well. And just being around like brilliant minds and I mean, great people. Um, yeah, they've helped me improve at poker a lot and I couldn't have done it without like my core, my core uh, poker peers. Um, when it comes to outside of poker, uh, of course, my parents have been always there and I would have to say, you know, they've given me everything I, I've needed to be successful. Like, there's no doubt. They've given me every opportunity. So, mm. um, and if I could relate it to a sports figure, <laughs> like I did about Figo, which I wasn't even the biggest fan of Figo. I liked him, but I was a kid. I didn't yeah. really know much about him. I mean, nowadays, Messi for me is like, I'm not someone who's like gushing over too many athletes or celebrities or I'm not that interested, but like for, for some reason, Messi is just, I mean, I know what reason is because he's incredible. He seems down to earth and I love the way he, he plays football. I mean, he's obviously a genius and the way he gets tackled and then gets up and keeps playing and like his demeanor is, I'm like, I'm in awe every time I watch this guy play. I'm just like, like how can this guy even be human? And I mean, I know Messi's a favorite of like everybody, yeah, yeah. but like, holy crap, like, and he's still doing it. Like, and he just doesn't stop. Like I just watched the Liverpool Barcelona game when I was in mm -hmm. Monaco with a bunch of guys and yeah, he's just like a genius. Yeah. Is there, is there an equivalent in poker to Messi? Has there been? Tough question. Uh, I don't know if you can compare it. No, I don't think so. <laughs> you can't. It's tough. Because, yeah. yeah, poker, people have their ups and downs. Messi, no. <laughs> I, guess it's, I guess it's about expression, right? So Messi's like the world's best at finding space and doing things that other mm -hmm. people are not bold enough to do. Right. And I guess in poker, you can just play by the rules, do the right things you're supposed to do. But right. then every now and then, you, you've got to do something right. you know, creative. Right. And, yeah, exactly. With poker, even the best poker players in the world, you know, they have moments where they doubt themselves and, and all this. Um, yeah, I think it's hard, maybe it's hard to compare Messi to a particular poker player, but mm. yeah. Do you ever remember the, the, a time when you looked around the room and didn't feel like you fit in? Um, I think I've had moments in my career where I've always felt pretty good, but I've had moments in my career where I was like, holy shit, I need to get working. Like I've had that. Yeah, I had that a few years ago where I was playing a tournament and I knew guys were working very hard and I hadn't been at that time and I felt it and I was like, okay, you need to take two months off and get your ass to work and not play and you need to get better. Yeah. And if someone's uh, watching this wanting to get better, how, how do you get better in poker? What, 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 what are the type of things that you focus on? I mean, there's so many tools. Um, of course, solvers are a huge thing mm. that uh, most people are using nowadays. I mean, that revolutionized the way I play poker and most people play poker. Um, and when it comes down to it, it's just putting in the work. Like, you can't just show up and get it in, you know, 10 hours. It's, you got to sit there and it's tedious and it's boring, <laughs> but you got to put in the time uh, and it's, yeah, you got to put in a lot of hours. Um, and then there are other things you can watch streams like those are amazing because you know now I think every like there's party poker there's Triton there's poker stars um, that all have streams of the high stakes stuff yeah. and just watching those and watching how the top level players play and think about the game is is a really valuable tool um, but yeah and also I mean playing poker in, in itself is one of the best ways to learn, of course. Like, 
as long as you're playing and you know if you're not sure about a situation it's your job then to fix it and not be unsure the next time there was um a great blog post that got turned into a book called the top five regrets that die in by a palliative care nurse called Bronnie Ware. So she interviewed all these people who were dying. Sorry to like really down, put a downer on it. No. Um, and she figured out through her research that there were five things that people regretted, right? Mm -hmm. When they were dying. One was to live a life true to themselves. Okay. Uh, the other one was to not work so hard. Mm -hmm. There you are, you got that one wrong. Um, yeah. Courage to express your feelings. Yeah. Uh, stay in touch with your friends and mm -hmm. to be happier. Mm -hmm. Do any of them strike a chord with you I at mean, all? Yeah, all of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, that just sounds like exactly the five things you need to do to, <laughs> to live a full, uh, fulfilled life. Let yeah. me put that question a different way then. Okay. What, what are you not doing more of now that you should be? I think the last couple of years, I think it's been a little bit of a whirlwind and I haven't, I've kind of lost a little bit the part of me where being a little more present and a little more in touch with myself and, you know, um, knowing how my body's functioning and things like that, where I think I used to be really good at that. And I think the last couple of years in particular, uh, I've gone really hard with poker and yeah, I've, I've lost that a little bit because I'm usually working on, you know, 60% of myself because I'm exhausted through playing or or what have you so uh, That's something I I need to I need to work on It's super important though because I've been sh I've been in the corner what you know I got like a full mm -hmm. uh, Spectral view of everybody and I see you getting up regularly and stretching and moving around mm -hmm. and then I look at other people There's people smoking there. There's people eating yeah. garbage, you know, yeah. it's like and nobody's moving Yeah, so it is really important isn't it for a top high stakes poker yeah. player? I think I think though, I mean, everyone's different. So I need it. Like I've always been a person or when I was a kid, I was always moving around playing sports or with friends and playing outside, going to the forest, these kind of things. I've always been doing something. So yeah, everyone's different. Some kids have been, or some guys have been playing computer games for many, many years and sitting out, sitting around a lot and they're, they're used to it. And maybe that's, uh, that's okay for them. But for me, for my mind to function best for me, <laughs> I need to be moving a lot. So I tend to get up and move around a lot and just not sit there and try to get some blood <laughs> moving in my body and to my brain. Um, so yeah, I mean, everyone's different, like I said. And yeah, some guys don't mind crushing food and smoking cigarettes and that's okay, with, that's okay to me. Um, but yeah, for me, that would make me drowsy and feel crappy. And, mm. Yeah, you you said there about presence, uh, losing a bit of presence within yourself. But mm. I, I imagine correlating to that is losing presence with other people around you. Not necessarily poker, because you're all you're all in the same boat. Yeah. Um, but is that felt in your life as well, in your relationships outside of poker, where you're in a whirlwind and you're, yeah. you're not really there? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I, you know, I do things that I never used to do, where maybe I a friend sends me a message and I completely forget about it. I see it and I'm, you know, maybe I'm about to go to sleep or maybe I'm in a tournament and I just completely forget about it. And then I take like a week to respond and I never probably thought I would be that guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's something I'm trying to work on. And I have these moments where I'm like, okay, you need to, you know, have a day where you go walk around the city, go get a coffee, reconnect with some people, see how people are doing. Um, and yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to lose that, and it's something I need to to focus on. And of course, traveling so much. Yeah, I miss my miss my family a lot, and I have nieces and nephews, and I'm I really do miss them dearly. Um, and it's sad because they're growing up and very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's you know that's something I've I've had to think about, and yeah, it's a little upsetting, but. I try to keep in contact. I I mean, of course, there's FaceTime and mm -hmm. these kind of things that I'm going back to see them as much as I can. And, but it's not, a, it's not easy. We're in a different world these days. We think we're missing, yeah. we think we're missing these kids and they jump on FaceTime and think that's life. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. oh, there's Uncle Tim like, on uh, FaceTime again. Yeah, yeah. You know? exactly. Um, I saw a tweet uh, not long ago from Patrick Leonard and uh, he wrote something about, I'm paraphrasing here, um, when we talk about the really great players in the mm -hmm. world, someone who doesn't get enough justice is Timothy Adams. Okay. And he talked about how you've been crushing it for so long mm -hmm. in so many levels you know we talked about a few of the things already today but just to recap 
What is it about you that's made you so successful? I mean, I think it would be cons being consistent. Um, I really try to like bring my best game as much as I can. Of course, I don't always play my best game because uh, I'm a human. <laughs> but I think it's just consistency, not being reckless, listening to yourself, like not playing when you're tired, not playing when you're tilted. These kind of things are huge. And I've had to learn the hard way when I was younger. And I think a lot of it has to do with, I've been playing poker now for so many years that I, you know, I've been through, <laughs> I've been th through those stages in my career where I played when I, when I shouldn't be playing. I've, you know, played when I'm tired and I've, you know, lost, usually lost money playing like that. Yeah. So as you get older, you, you know, you're not, you're less impulsive. You're, you know, I probably had to, you know, screw up tons of times to finally get it, but, and I still, you know, I'm not, I'm not perfect. Um, but yeah, I would say consistency is definitely key, like, like anything in life, yeah. And finally, how does, uh, how does playing high stakes poker make you feel? I mean, I just love to compete. Like, some guys like playing main events because they like to beat up on weaker players and that's fun, but I love competing against the top poker minds, yeah. That drives me, it gets me excited. Uh, it makes me want to get better seeing how good some of my opponents are. And yeah, I just love competing at the highest level. It's the, it's a, yeah, it's a really good feeling, especially when you feel like you're getting better and you've played well and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And of course, when you don't play well and you make some mistakes and stuff, it can be frustrating, but it forces you to get better because these guys will yeah, pick you apart <laughs> if, you, if you don't. It's pretty unforgiving. Yeah. Like vultures around a prey. Um, yeah. Timothy Adams, thanks for joining us on yeah. We Are High Stakes Poker. I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cheers. I am Timothy Adams, and I am High Stakes Poker.